good, right? Yeah, I love a good time of worship, and so, uh, man, thank you for uh, being part of that. You know, we can, we can feel the Lord's presence during worship, and that's because the Lord's people are worshiping, and so I thank you guys for your part of that, each and every one of us as we stop and we worship the Lord in our life, right? Bring the presence of the Lord into the room. And it's powerful. We want to do things in our life in remembrance of who he is, in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want our life to be a fragrant aroma. We do, to be just pouring out to the Lord. I don't know, man, during that worship, I started getting excited. And I was like, oh, this day's got to kind of be this day of taking communion, and, and we need to just, you know, make sure we're giving reverence to the Lord. But the other end of that is... We need to scream and cheer and be joyful to the Lord for the things that he's done and the things that he's continuing to do in our lives. We need to celebrate what we have with, you know, fellowship. It's one of the reasons that, you know, typically people are like, you did a barbecue on communion. Did you know that? And I'm like, yeah, actually I did, right? We're going to kind of go into this idea of finishing up something and going and, and celebrating. And part of what makes communion special is obviously Christ. But part of what makes communion special is that we take communion together as his family, as his children. So we are wrapping up Hebrews, way past wrapping it up. We've covered just a, a huge array of topics in Hebrews, digging into it. And we come to this conclusion today. Um, but before we come to the very final thought I want you to have, and if you're looking for kind of those who like to just get to the punchline, this is what we're going to be talking about all day today. In remembrance of me. Who is Christ in your life? Because really the, the letter to the Hebrews was this letter that's constantly asking us this question. Who is Christ in your life? And if you haven't figured it out, that's okay. The most important thing is this. Don't stop asking that question until you figure it out. Keep asking. Hebrews is a really unique book of the Old Testament. We just got done going through that. Um, one of the things that makes it unique is its structure and its style is not like other letters. And so it's designed to kind of help give us a purpose or a deeper meaning of what this letter is about. So if you look at Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, we're going to kind of just do a recap because, hey, if the book of Hebrews spends its time remembering Christ, why don't we look at that as a recap to remember him before we take communion together. But Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, this is one of the most unique parts of Scripture that you can find in all the books. But it starts off like this. The first word is God. After he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. And so it begins as an essay. But it, it begins as an essay that starts off with God. Just God. So right off the bat, the author is assuming that you just know who God is. Everybody knows who God is. We can just write as we're talking about God. Because at this time, and the group of people he was work, working with and writing to, there was a belief there amongst them that they knew who God was. And so they just knew. They understood the existence. They understood the belief behind it. They understood the need to lean into it. But it's one of the questions we should all ask ourselves in our own personal lives. Do you know who God is? Do you know that he's working? Can you look at all creation around us and see that there's something bigger than myself at play here? And the thing is, is this. If you don't have God all dialed in and figured out every detail yet, that's okay. Just start working on the idea that, hey, maybe there's a God of the universe out there that wants to know me, wants to have a relationship with me wants to be involved with me, and just start thinking that. But it begins as this essay, right? And what do essays do? They lay down a thought. And this thought is this. God spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many ways and many portions. But today he's going to speak to us a little different. We're going to get to that later, right? Because this letter progresses into a sermon. And I always love that. Every single commentary I looked at said, Wow, right about Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, it picks up as a sermon. And I thought, man, is this what sermons stand, sound like? It kind of made me chuckle a little bit as a pastor, but it's like, 
For this reason, we must pay close attention. Sounds like a parent, right? The pastor comes to give the sermon now. So got to get your hand up there. But it says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. And so it's kind of addressing this idea of God and what you've heard about God. Don't drift away from it. We live in a world right now that has gone to such lengths, such extent, to try and erase God, to try and wipe God out. And I tell you what, if you're like me at all, okay, and you kind of, when things start, you know, why, why, why are they so intent on removing this idea? I want to know what's the real truth behind it. I want to know what's going on. And so we look at a world around us right now that we, we're, everywhere you go, just about everything goes. You know what I mean? You can dress like you want. You can do whatever you want. You know what I mean? You can pick your identity. You can pick your gender. You can pick anything you want in our world right now. But if I stand up and say, I want to talk about God. Now, we can't talk about that topic. I'm like, uh, how come? What's going on there that I need to know more information about? Right? And so I challenge people, dig in. Dig into who God is. But it progresses into this sermon um, in Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, which is really giving us this warning that, hey, start figuring out who God is, who he is in your life, who he wants to be. As it says in Hebrews 2, 4, God also testifying with them that both signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And so God testifying with you means you met him. You found him. Something happened. And so there's a way to know God. There's a way to find God. And there's a way to seek God. And so if you're not feeling that right now, you know, tight with God, feeling that brotherly love or that godly love or that parental love, that's okay. Make a decision today that says, you know what? I'm going to draw the line in the sand. I'm going to figure out how to get closer into this relationship with God. Because I think that's where it starts for all of us. That's where it started for me. And so this letter progresses in a sermon which starts off, you know, like I said, says, hey, God, we're getting this essay, and then we're getting this warning, and then it goes back and ends as a letter in Hebrews 13, 20 through 21, but it does it with a prayer, which is really cool. It says, now the God of peace, so he's writing his in conclusion. Anybody who's out there and written any papers in their life, this is it. It says, in conclusion, he says, Now the God of peace who brought you up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equipped you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so we get this glory being given to God, right? But how do you like that? Now, the God of peace who brought you up from the dead. So who was dead? Who was dead? Well, the penalty for sin is death. Sin separates us from God. That penalty is death. And we all have sinned. And we all had that separation, right? That block between us and the Lord. And Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, this is what this verse is telling us, died on the cross to repair that relationship. And one of the coolest parts about Hebrews, which we looked at in Hebrews 10, is because of that repair, I can boldly enter into the throne room and now have a relationship with God the Father. And you know what's the coolest thing about that? It continues to grow. I wish I could go back to when I first became a Christian because I remember walking around going, man, I'm, I'm broken inside. I'm empty. Something was missing. And I had been trying to fill it with everything of the world, right? For me, that was sex, drugs, rock and roll. And I was trying to fill that. It was a spot that was designed that only God could fill. And I decided, okay, well, 30-something years old, I feel like I tried everything else. Let's go. I want to just give my life to God. And so I gave that part of my life to God. And he filled it. And I had this personal moment, okay, that I looked back at. And I was like, it felt really loud, like I was in the room with God. But it was like this loud peace that I'd never had anywhere else before in my life. And I look back and I think, 
I wish I could go back and tell that young man 20 years ago, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Because now that I've been walking with the Lord for 20 years, and I go into the throne room, I hear him. He talks. He engages with me. If he's not engaging you with you in that way, it's okay. He will. Trust it. Just start leaning in. Because a lot of times, how many people have ever been able to have a relationship that they haven't leaned into? It's kind of a trick question, right? Yeah. All relationships require that we lean into that. And so that's kind of what Hebrews is finally, finally telling us, is that we've got to be able to lean into this and be involved. Reach into people's lives. Dig in. You know what I mean? And the Lord is waiting for us in that. He's waiting for us to enter into a relationship with him. The problem is the letter of the Hebrews, it's deep, it's challenging. It talks about how we're children that have died, children of wrath, people that need to be born again, and we're looking at ourselves that we're alive. What are you talking about? It talks about how Jesus' blood is a greater sacrifice than all the old sacrifices of the old covenant. It talks about how Jesus is greater than Moses, how he's greater than the angels, how he's greater than anything, how he's the ultimate creator. But the important thing is this. In the end of the day, no matter how deep and how challenging the contents of Hebrews is, and no matter how much we sit there and ponder this whole entire scripture, I've been thinking about this because we're going to start digging into the letter to James. Okay? What my faith lived out like. What my faith, the fruit of my life. So if I'm doing this in remembrance of Christ, then what does he mean to me? If I'm living out my faith in the context... I got really off track, sorry. It's okay, that's what happens when you start talking. If I live out my faith in the context, right, of my belief that my belief actually dictates my actions, okay, then what does that look like? Well, remember, to me, it looks like I'm reading this thing like crazy because what God did to me in my life is huge, the power of God working in my life. Discipleship is important to me. Fellowship is important to me. I always tell people, if your belief or your faith doesn't look like you want it to look right now, if your faith doesn't look like you want it to look, your Christian walk, communion is a wonderful time to draw that line in that sand. You know, get it out there, draw the line in the sand, say, starting tomorrow, I am going to start doing some of the things that I want to do. Well, the first thing we need to do is get that bar of belief up. Get that belief up in our life. How much do you believe in Jesus? Do you really believe that, like, his sin paid the price for your death? Okay. Do you believe that, like, sort of, or do you, like, sit there and go, oh, you know, I, would, I was going to die. I was going to die. The penalty for that is death. And do we play that out serious in our life? Hebrews is a warning of apostasy. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. This is a key verse that we all need to take a look at because this is a lot of times, as Christians, something we don't want to talk about. So I saved it for the very end, and we can just not talk about it too much here. But we can talk about it. But it says this, For in this case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good works of God and the powers of the age to come, and have fallen away. So these people believed, and then they kind of fell away from their faith. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to shame. And so we have this idea that like we can fall away from our faith. Well, you know what? For me, personally, the times I've seen that, Okay, it's not somebody sitting on the top of this high mount cliff and then they're just like, boom, off the side, falling away. Okay, it's like this. Nah, yeah, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, go to, I'll go next Tuesday to my Bible study. Eh, I'll, I'll pick up the book tomorrow and read it. Eh, you know, I, I just want to go home from work today. And, uh, you know. and so it's this little slippery slope that we just take a couple steps back. Well, the way to work into our faith is the same way. Get our belief up and just start leaning in. Just start leaning in and taking a couple steps each day and saying, you know what, I don't understand this thing, but I'm walking by some faith. Because we all walk on faith on a lot of topics. 
Really, you do. I mean, we could get our bank accounts out in here and look at how much faith some of us are walking by, right? So we all walk by faith on different areas, right? We need to put our faith where it really counts, in Christ. Let's get it off of some of those other things. And so there's a warning, though. We can't just bounce along and do whatever we want. That's what that always means to me. Hebrews is a reminder that Christ is better than, and there's a blank there. That blank is wherever you were before you accepted Jesus Christ into your life. And if you hadn't, you know, then you're going to get an opportunity to do that. That blank for me, I was in a really dark spot in my life before I had Jesus in it. I lived in a world where I believed that there was a God that created everything, and then he had left us 7,000 years ago to just kind of figure it all out on our own. And I was like, <laughs> how are you supposed to figure this all out in 100 years? And most of the time I was walking around miserable. But Hebrews 8, 1 through, through 2 says, Now the main point is what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister in the sanctuary, in the true tabernacle, which is the Lord pitch, not man. And so we have a different game plan going on, right? Where I can have a better than whatever I was, I can now have this new hope in Christ, Okay? Because I have become his temple. He has put the Holy Spirit in me. And that's that security. That when I look at that and goes, man, Hebrews is a reminder that Christ is better than whatever I was doing. Okay? And God backs that. And he says, let's walk together. Let's do this. Okay? In remembrance of me, one of the things I love about this ceremony more than ever when you look at it in Scripture is Jesus is leading the way. He grabs the cup first and says, take this. And he's out leading the charge. And man, you've got to love following a leader who's out there leading. And it's one of the things that we're just missing in our culture right now. But Jesus was that kind of guy. And you probably don't, probably don't see that as many areas of your life. And so, is, is Christ better than for everything for you? And I know it kind of sounds weird to say it that way. But, like, is Christ better than everything for you? Have you stopped? This is, my, you know, you walk somebody into your house, and you go, this is my favorite room, or this is my favorite vehicle, or this is my favorite card for those younger kids in here who play cards, right? This is my favorite. How many times did this is my favorite restaurant? Well, hold on. Let's pull over the side of the road. This is my favorite God. Look what he made. You know what I mean? And uh, my friend came into town yesterday, and uh, one of the things that I could walk, I, you, you know when you can see something in somebody's eyes? Well, you should have seen him checking out the gorge and how beautiful it was driving in. Majestic. I think he even used that term at one point. And so, you know, what is God to you? How majestic is, is the heavens? And then he sits on this throne above all of it. And, and when you're doing this in remembrance of me, what are you remembering? What are you pondering in your, in your heart? And so uh, for me, I think Hebrews really reminds me who Christ is. And I love how it opens up. And so I thought I would just read how it opens up in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. And then we'll hop in and we'll take communion together. And so God, which is beautiful. We're not going to debate. We just know there's a God. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, he has spoken to us, his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had, pur when he had made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he had inherited a more an excellent name than they. And so we have this wonderful God, right? And so today, for those who want to partake in communion, um, I, I you know, encourage you to join us. Communion, for those who don't know, if people don't know, is what our Lord has asked us to do in remembrance of him. And so remember who he was by doing this ceremony. And if you'd like to join us, I'd love you to, you know, give your life to Jesus Christ. I always love to right before communion, give everybody the opportunity to give your life to Christ, 
draw the line in the sand, dig in deeper, recommit, all of the above, whatever one is on your heart. And so I'll kind of, you know, do a prayer for that first. So, Father God, we, uh, we know that our sins have separated us from who you are, from you, and from being like you. And so, Lord, we know that uh, something needed to be redone to repair that. So, Lord, we, uh, we praise you that you stepped into humanity and died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. We just praise you in that. And, uh, Lord, we, uh, I ask you, you know, to be bold in my life. I want you in my life. I ask you to be my king, to be the center of my life, to be my God. Uh, Lord, I don't always know exactly what that looks like, but Lord, I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, my God. And, uh, Lord, uh, ultimately, um, we praise you. And we love you, and uh, we thank you for what we've done. For those who need to draw a line in the sand today, Lord, and Dig in deeper with their relationship. Look at what their life in Christ plays out, Lord. I pray that you put that on their heart. Lord, those of us that need to step up into roles of leadership and to the next level, um, Lord, I pray that you put that on our heart. Lord, wherever we are, you are always drawing us near to you. And so, Lord, speak to us during this time of communion. Talk into our lives. Talk into our hearts. Talk into our souls and strengthen us. We praise you for that. So, everybody want to stop and, and look in front of them. There should be communion cups in front of everybody. And if not, there's one close. I tried to put them out to, yeah, minimize, you know. Everybody's got those opening up because they already know what to do. It's kind of a weird culture we live in. I kind of miss the time of passing it out where you have time to, yeah, think a little bit. So I thought I'd create a little bit of that today in here, um, just in some silence, you know. The Lord Jesus in the night which he betray was betrayed took bread, right? Took bread. And so think about that. Think about what that means. Think about what that means to you for a minute. Think about what, you know, he talks about his body, being broken. What does that mean to you? Because the reality is, as we're doing this, remember to who Christ is to us. 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 24 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So he's receiving this from the Lord and delivering it to us. That the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this remembrance of me. And I can just imagine the Lord Jesus sitting at that table and they're like, okay, he's just breaking the bread. And I'm not sure if they know exactly what he was talking about. Okay? But here, 2,000 years later, we look at that broken bread and we see Jesus' broken body lying up on the cross for us, taking one, one, one monstrous beating on his way to paying the penalty for all of sin. And why did he choose to do it that way? It blows my mind. But he did. Because something inside of us understands that level of sacrifice of a man's life. And so I ask you, when you do this in remembrance of me, you do this in remembrance of his broken body, do we do this in remembrance of the fact that Jesus gave his life for us? So do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you have proclaimed the Lord's death until he comes. And so we do this in remembrance of his blood. And I always want to remember at Passover, at the Seder, you know, we would go into the cup with our fingers ten times for the ten plagues, and you put it on the corner of your plate. And that was what that last cup, after you ate, because you ate the Passover lamb. I don't know why they did it in that order, but they did it, you know, that's how we did it in my house. We ate the Passover lamb, and then we finished that fourth cup, that last cup after, and did that part where you do it in remembrance of me for each time. And it's a beautiful thing, and I look at that, and I'm like, man, for Jesus to have picked up that cup at that Lord's Supper like that, at that Passover Seder, when they were ready, like, probably expecting him to put his finger in it or something at that point. And he says, no, do this and remember it to me because this is going to be my blood. And what he's saying to us is, when are you going to stop in your lives and remember me? When are you going to stop and draw that line in that sand and in remembrance of me and who I am? And he goes, you know what? This is when you're going to do it. Because there's very few commands that the Lord Jesus Christ have given us. I had a conversation with a guy the other day, and he says, Christianity is so locked up in rules. I'm like, really? Because I can only think of a couple that the Lord gave us. Love one another. You love your neighbors, right? Do this in remembrance of me. And so really, the Lord Jesus, what he wants is us to understand who he is. And again, in remembrance of me. And so... Let's take a second and think about that, then I'll read the verse. But what does his blood mean to you personally? Like on a real personal level for communion as you take fellowship with the Lord. In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, in remembrance of him. We are... Yeah, I love taking communion together. We are going to be looking at the Lord's Supper a little deeper next time we take communion together because I'm going to be breaking down over a couple weeks why we take the Lord's Supper. So if you have more questions and concerns about that, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how the, the Passover was set up, what it really meant to do that in remembrance of me. And I think it's important that we all start learning some of those you know, those things that help us see that there was a deeper detail behind what was going on that night. And so, because we can see our Lord um, at that night is giving them insight to what's coming, and they're kind of missing that. And it's okay, because we all miss things. But us now looking at with the insight that we have can allow us to see Jesus in different perspectives. So when we wrap up James, we're going to step into James for the next six weeks, and then when we wrap that up, we're going to come back and do communion again and look in communion over a couple weeks a little bit deeper. So, All right, well, let's pray. Father God, we, uh, we praise you. We love you. We thank you that we can uh, take communion with you, that we can have fellowship together, fellowship with you more than anything. Lord, we praise you for that, that you make it possible for us to take communion, to have communion, and to just be in a relationship with you. Lord, I, uh, I praise you for everybody that's in the room, because for me, standing from where I am, um, it's evidence. It's evidence that there's a living God. As I watch my brothers and sisters take communion and, and acknowledge you, and uh, I love that. I love watching people acknowledge you, Lord. It's a wonderful thing. Now let our lives continue to acknowledge you as we go out together in a time of fellowship As we go out together in the world around us, let us continue to be a fragrant aroma. Let us continue to be loving, helping people understand who you are. Lord, there's a world full of people out there right now that maybe they don't know you like we know you. And um, Lord, help open doors so that we can know, help them, help them know you. 
Help us do our part. And, uh, Lord, ultimately, we are your hands and feet, so guide us, strengthen us, empower us, and equip us. And we just pray that all in Jesus' mighty name. They all said...